Welcome to the second lesson in this course, The Basics of Storm Chase Targeting. Today we're going to talk about surface patterns and we're going to talk about just all of the different boundaries that you would target as a storm chaser. And uh, you know, we'll talk about four main ones. There are many more outside of that, but for the most part, 90% of your storm chasing experience will be spent on the four main boundaries. Again, the disclaimer, storm chasing is dangerous. This guide is meant as a supplement to any official training you may get, but keep in mind that your safety is yours alone and you should really just use common sense when storm chasing. There's a reason why so few people have been hurt or killed storm chasing. It's because everybody that has come before you has used common sense for the most part. So anyways, outside of that, let's go to the surface boundaries. These are the main boundaries we're going to talk about. Dry lines, cold fronts, warm fronts, outflow boundaries. You have the others. I have those asterisks because they will not be part of this lesson. Uh, but those others include things like differential heating boundaries and uh, just things like that that are not on here that are just, you know, they're not things that we will talk about. Uh, they're just... I guess the best way to put it, they're not big concerns for storm chasing. Now, this is from the NSSL. I actually, in full disclosure, found it on Wikipedia <laughs> in an image search on Google, but it is from the NSSL. It shows the surface boundaries. Tornado Alley is mislabeled, in my opinion. It should be more like that, but anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll forget that. Anyways, when we're talking about surface boundaries, we're talking about air masses, colliding warm moist air moving north cold dry air moving south warm dry air moving east where the warm and dry warm, warm moist air and warm dry air meet that's called a dry line where the cold dry air meets and the, you know the moist or dry warm air meets that's a cold front where the warm moist air is pushing north into the cold dry air that is a warm front etc 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 so now that you know those things again we're not getting into meteorology that deep on this uh lesson we're actually talking more so along the lines of storm chasing and just general what does all that mean so anyways let's go and talk about the dry lie this is a surface chart from may 31st 2013 the el reno day this is lifted straight from the national weather service norman event page it just does such a good job of explaining the dry line. Basically hot, dry, and stable air to the west of the dry line. Warm, moist, and extremely unstable air, or just unstable air, to the east of the dry line. And where those two meet, you know, that's that surface convergence. That's where you get storms. Uh, also, I put how chasing was born. I mean, all the forefathers of chasing... They made a living chasing these things. I mean, this is where this is where the magic has always been. It's the dry line. Uh, the dry line is great for a variety of reasons uh, as a chase target. First off, you can oftentimes get isolated storm modes off of the dry line, which when it comes to photography, visibility, etc., dry lines are just hard to beat. Now, they do come with a boomer bust kind of problem. First off, convergence along this boundary could be weak, and you could end up, because of that, having issues getting storms to form. Also, you can have uh, you know, the dry air really mix in east of the dry line, creating high base storms initially, and it takes them a long time to get going. Sometimes you, know, you can get 70 degrees right up against 20 degrees, 6,000 cape, you know, great wind shear, days like El Reno, where the storm goes up, it begins to spin immediately, and then it does crazy things. I mean, that can happen. Dry lines, though, as far as uh, if you're looking for great photography, etc., dry lines are hard, hard, hard to beat. Next thing we're going to talk about are warm fronts. Basically, as we talked about warm fronts, when you have this warm and moist air mass, you know, 60, mid 60 dew points pushing northwards into, you know, 50s and 30s, you know, this is winter, this is spring, this is April 9th of this past year, the Rochelle Day. You know, you have a warm front lifting north this is where it's at i mean this is you'll oftentimes get storms forming along these especially uh especially when they begin to stall a little bit and you get that nice convergence along them the problem with warm fronts i mean they can be tornado machines for sure the problem with warm fronts is that you typically on many occasions i mean unless you're out here in the midwest 
a, you know, an Illinois warm front is just, you know, traditionally kind of magical for storm chasing at least. Uh, but when you're back here on the plains, you kind of want to be near the low where, you know, usually they'll have a warm front and a dry line stretching south, the triple point. That's a really magical place because of the warm front all that but warm fronts really they do a few things one surface winds are usually backed along them you can see the pressure gradient here uh, along the warm front but the winds are usually backed along them a little bit so that enhances low level shear there's usually a little bit more enhanced vorticity because of all of that and because of that any storm that forms and rides the warm front typically does some crazy things now there are a few drawbacks to warm fronts. First off, HP modes, a little bit more likely here. Also getting crowded convective evolutions, which does result in HP modes, also likely. The other thing is that if you target too far east, especially back here on the plains, where you'll have a huge EML, big time cap, oftentimes the lift along a warm front isn't enough to overcome that. And you end up with, you know, you can end up with massive cape values, incredible indices along a warm front, but you never get storms. And the reasoning behind that is actually quite simple. You just have a monster cap that just will, in a hundred years will never be broken because the main storm system and lift is back off to the west. And so yeah, that happens sometimes. Now let's talk about cold fronts. Cold fronts are a decent chase target so long as they are not crashing. If so, doom. Why is that? Well, a crashing cold front, whenever you see like really strong winds behind a cold front like this and it's crashing south, well, you're going you've got a lot of lift along that for sure so yeah you can get storms but they're going to almost certainly be in the form of a squall line and if not that they're going to be undercut by the cold front you'll have a storm form here cold front will move under it and then it'll be elevated behind the cold front for tornadoes or photogenic storms cold fronts just really don't do it you can if a cold front is moving slow or if it's more along the lines of a stalled front because it's moving so slow cold fronts can be kind of nice in that regard sometimes but for the most part i would say if you're targeting a cold front more than 80 percent of the time you're going to be disappointed now let's talk about everybody's favorite outflow boundaries which are magical until they are not uh this is the beginning stages of an outflow boundary actually uh this is what's in nebraska and you can see around this little cluster of multi-cell storms, they've gusted out and there's outflow, this little blue line, it's, it's pushing out. This is basically a cold front pushing out into the warm, moist air away from these storms. Now, when it comes to targeting for storm chasing, you're not targeting this right now. This is not what you're looking for. The next day, say this outflow boundary is still sticking around, uh, you know, six counties south. It's obvious there's cold air north of it, there's warm air south of it, it's going to stick around. Then it's basically at that point it becomes an effective warm front. And at that point, again, if you can get storms along it, it could end up being a magical tornado machine kind of chase day. However, there's a lot of days they're not. That's because either the front the outflow boundary is just too weak and you don't get storms against a strong cap or the outflow boundary is in the presence of a weak cap and you get storms everywhere or it could just be the simple fact the outflow boundary is so weak it washes out by afternoon and it doesn't become a factor in storm development at all that day so outflow boundaries are something that you tend to want want to keep an eye on especially if they're more subtle uh you know maybe intersecting a dry line that wouldn't be a bad spot to target so outflow boundaries are something you look for for sure so to sum it all up Dry lines, they're a classic chase hotspot, but they're boomer bust. Warm fronts, they're machines when it comes to tornadoes, oftentimes, but you got to beware the cap, beware messy storm modes, beware HP, etc. Cold fronts, as we talked about, not ideal chase targets, especially when they're crashing. And lastly, as we just talked about, outflow boundaries, which are strong but stalled, act as effective warm fronts. You always have to be watching them for tornadoes again without flow boundaries the big thing without flow boundaries is that uh, one last note on them before we're done if they are still cruising south and it is like early afternoon it's time to give up on that thing i mean they're especially once you get into mid-afternoon if they're moving south it's over that day is over you're not getting storms that are going to be too great along that so anyways that's your surface boundaries where we're going next we're going to talk about each of these more in depth so we'll see you next time